they didn't they, they wanted to make sure they had enough of, of the enzyme available they didn't want to start and then run out of supplies but i'm wondering for kids whose hearts are already you know a pretty good size may some enzyme be made available you know just maybe um, on a short term basis so that their heart won't continue to increase in size you know maybe it, like Genzyme and Novozyme, yeah. we'll talk about this this afternoon. I mean, it is a major issue about supply and when you can start patients. Are there more questions? Oh, sorry. Ready to go. I'll try to be short. It's a story about two patients. This is the patient that is now in the Essen trial. She presented at age three months with really a not so uncommon, pre with a common presentation of feeling difficulties, the uh, pediatrician heard a cardiac murmur, referred her. The chest x-ray showed a clearly hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, enlarged heart on the chest x-ray with a cardiothoracic index more than 0.5, which was an inclusion criteria, um, and a typical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, at which point a pediatric cardiologist refer her to me as this is Pompe disease unless you tell us otherwise, but you'll have to do hard work to convince us. When I looked at the patient, what was really striking was a very strong cough, hypertrophy of the calf muscles, which I only know in this disease to exist uh, at a very early age. Um, the laboratory data showed the increased uh, creatine kinase and CK levels. The EMG surprisingly was normal, which usually it is abnormal at this age. The diagnosis was confirmed in first in leukocytes and later in fibroblast at less than 1% residual enzyme activity level in fibroblast. That was measured in three different laboratories. They all, this is the Rotterdam assay. And the parents have uh, normal activity in the same range as the in-assay control. The mutation so far done in Dr. Rose's lab confirmed that she has delta exome 18, which has been seen in infantile patients. And the second allele was not present in the cDNA and is probably not expressed at the mRNA level. There is where things come in differently. In uh, one assay, she was crim negative. In another one, she was crim positive. I'm sorry. Her evolution on the cardiac side, at age seven months, she started to have some mild tachypnea, and she got diuretics twice, two times a week very mild diuretic regime. At age nine months, there was an um, atelectasis of the lower lobe of the left lung, and she got digitalis. At age 12 months, that atelectasis has increased, although there is still a portion of the left, of the upper lobe of the left lung, which is not completely compressed. Otherwise, cardiac wash she has been stable. You can see a slight decrease in her tolerance to decrease of fluid intake when she's ill. Here are the, um, we don't, our, our uh, cardiologists don't regularly 
calculate left ventricular wall masses. They measured the, um, the thickness of the left ventricular wall. And you should see, which is in the septum, and in the yellow is the left posterior ventricular wall over here, slowly going up. These are tremendously large masses. Normal being about is this five millimeters. These are at least twi twice the normal size as far as mass uh, at that moment, as far as thickness of the, of the septum. Fractional shortening has always remained within the normal range. It's, it's dropped a little bit, but it's never gone into uh, failure. Or motor evolution. At three months, there was mild hypotonia, slight, uh, slight lag. Um, at four and a half months, she learned how to grasp. At six months, she could still lift her legs off the floor and bring her head forward in a pull to sit. The popliteal angle, which measures the tension in the knees, is, no, is completely normal. At seven months, she sat, was sitting in a tripod. That means she sits independently but holds her weight, balances it with her hands. She could roll over, uh, but in, when you put her on her belly, she can only come up to a horizontal side, whereas normally you would expect them to lift all the way up. At eight months, she's still sitting independent. She could sit independently, lift her legs and her lower body from the table, has a good head control in sit, with a mild lagging of her head in a pull to sit. At nine months, she starts to have a bit more difficulty in keeping her balance. At 12 months, all in the bottom, she still sits independently, but she has more difficulty in, in, in sitting. Her back bends a little bit, bends more. She still has good head control in sit, but she has a complete head lag when you pull her up. She can still lift her, head, her arms and grasp above the region of her shoulders. And here are pictures of her at her first birthday party, where in an Air castle, as you can see up, up there, she's sitting independently without holding on with her arms. Her treatment has involved carnitine in a relatively high protein diet. We added alanine according to the British regime, which the parents claim has improved, but I can't, uh, I can't affirm that that's made any difference. And because she fulfilled all the criteria, enrolled at age 13 months. Why she didn't enroll earlier was because we were not told that she could enroll earlier for several months. Case two, I do not have all the data. A lot of this is out of my memory from two years, from three years ago. It's a case we presented in Australia at age three months with cardiac decompensation. When I first saw her at age six months, she had mild hypotonia. She could sit. At age 12 months, she had the first cardiac decompensation and got cardiac drugs. And as best as I can remember, she died at 16 months of age. And she had, as far as I know, as residual enzyme activity, about a half percent residual enzyme activity. I'm trying to get the data on the second patient. I, I don't have them yet. So, no, I mean, this is 97, before any therapy. have the uh, information on case one, which is now that patient's in therapy in essence, is that right? It's case three in essence. Case three in essence, yes. yes. Are there any comments before or questions about uh, these patients right up the back? Is that patient, the one you, uh, the previous one, is uh, that patient on transgenic enzyme or on the show? enzyme. Okay. Okay. Well, perhaps we could move on uh, with answers presentation on juvenile uh, treatment with uh, the transgenic rabbit enzyme. Uh, is there more discussion about the selection of these patients and the identification of these patients? Uh, because I think from my particular point of view, uh, looking at lysosomal storage disorders in general, one of the um, one of the things that's consistent with Pompey is, as uh, you find with all other lysosomal storage disorders, there's considerable variation in the way patients, patients present and they develop the disease. Even though you may be looking at the 
severe end as we have been this morning, um, it, you can get considerable variation in the, um, the natural history of these patients. And so I think that means that we need to look at many patients to get uh, a general rule uh, being established. the childhood class. We've always been told we we're cross between juvenile and infantile. So is there a separate class now? Is it a question to me? Because I'm standing here, but I think... Take, take it away. Yeah. Take it away. <laughs> yeah. Um, there, whether there is a separate uh, entity that call, that's called childhood disease. What, what I showed you on, on the slide is that you can make as many separate entities as, as you want. And, um, and in fact, what, what's more uh, the case, I think, is that it's a spectrum. And in that spectrum, the infantile cases are, are the best defined. And, and also there is some variation, as you have seen <coughs> eh, and heard today, and what, what Johan now illustrates, and what, what, what also was illustrated on, on the survival uh, data. Um, but there, the disease is so severe that it is a very short, span, uh, short time span in which it, the range is. Is that clear to you? So, and therefore, we're talking about infantile, but you can talk about different subclasses. We prefer to talk about infantile and late onset. <coughs> Yes, yes, there is, but um, there is, that's one of the most important factors. But we also know that besides the enzyme activity, also genetic background, so the other, all the other genes we have play a role in the expression. And maybe I, I can show it here, because now I'm also going to talk about juvenile, but that's also... I start. I realize that you get very much information, and I don't know whether you still can take it. Yeah? Okay. Um, I would like to, um, to talk about enzyme therapy in, in late onset pompous disease. When we started a trial, we started a trial in seven patients. Four patients with the infantile form and three patients with late onset pompous disease. And the reason why uh, we did it was the fact that we didn't know the outcome. And um, it could have been that, that it didn't work out in the infants. And they may, then maybe you never gave the late onset patients a chance to prove that it could have some effect in them. So that was the reason. Um, we started in three juvenile patients, two with, with uh, a severe form, or were severely affected, and one was moderately affected. These were the inclusion criteria. And the reason why we chose an age over four is that we had to have a certain group of tests that we could follow. And it's very difficult to include, to follow, or to have tests, for example, pulmonary function tests, muscle strength testing, <laughs> in patients under four. So that was the reason why this age was chosen. And we had as, that, at, as entry criterion that the diagnosis has to be made before the age of 15. And of course, they had to have a acid alpha glucosidase deficiency. To make it a little bit uh, more yeah, visible for you, I want to introduce you to the patients. This is one of the patients at the age of 10 years. And you see that he only has mild symptoms. Here you have the patients at the age of about 15 years. He has developed a progressive scoliosis through his muscle weakness. He has been operated, and after the operation, he could not be weaned completely from the ventilator. So he, made, he remained ventilator dependent for the night. He had a tragia cannula over there for ventilation. Here is the patient at the start of the trial. At that moment, he was 30 years, 32 years of age and he was completely ventilator dependent and completely wheelchair bound. Here you see the patient at baseline. You can see that he doesn't, cannot move his legs.
And this is Tiffany. And you see that she has a severe scoliosis. And what she tries to do here is to do one of the items of one of the motor function tests during the trial. Then the last patient. He was the moderately affected patient. You see he's in, in a much better condition, but he's not able to lift himself up, and he's not able to stand. Okay. And here a kind of overview on the medical history. And what is then noticed is that these are the ages of the patients at onset of the trial. One patient had a normal uh, development, early development, and two showed a delayed development. All reported that they were clumsy in their early ages, that they were not very good at sports. First symptoms vary tremendously, as you may see. And what is notified here is that the moderately affected patient already had symptoms in the first year of life. He was not able to drink his bottles very well, and finally, he went to the doctor at 10 months of age, and he had a CK that was increased, and he was hypertonic, and they took a muscle biopsy, and the muscle biopsy was abnormal, but at that moment, they did not know what the, what the diagnosis was. So finally, at two and a half years, they sent the biopsy to an other hospital for second opinion, and they made the diagnosis. At that moment, he already an other boy was born in the family, and he also had pompous disease. Two of the severely affected patients were ventilator dependent, one 18 hours per day, the other 24 hours per day, and both had developed a scoliosis, which was in one case operated at 15 years, and in the other case during the trial. The enzyme was well tolerated by the patients. As you can see here, this patient is doing his homework during the infusion. And these were the infusion reactions we saw. Two patients never experienced any side effects. One patient had episodes of skin rashes and edema, but that patient is already symptom-free for now more than a year. And they do not receive any pre-medications, and all patients are treated on an outpatient basis. These are the alpha glucosidase activities at baseline and the glycogen contents. We started in a dose of 10 milligrams per kilograms, and during the trial, we made one dose adaptation, and this is a biopsy taken uh, 12 weeks after dose adaptation to 20 milligrams per kilogram, and here are the levels. And you see there is an increase in all, but it is not in the normal range. The normal range was 8 to 40. In all patients, there is some decrease of glycogen, and in one, it became normal. These are the tests we performed. This is handheld dynamometry. That is uh, muscle strength testing. You get a result in newtons, and we test all kinds of group, uh, muscle groups, 12 groups in total. And these are the results. In the moderately affected patient, we saw a very significant improve in the muscle strength. In, here in this patient, we see a mild increase in muscle strength, it's almost significant, but you see that it dependent, depends on how severely the patient was affected, whether we saw how much the increase was. And here you see it in both. In the other patients, there was a uh, scoliosis that interfered with the muscle strength, because when a scoliosis, when you have a scoliosis and it, it's severe, then it's kind of the Tower of Pisa and then it falls down more or less, and that's, that, that's what, what happened during the trial further. And at a certain moment, we had to choose 
to operate, and that was performed here. And then after the uh, operation, you have to immobilize the patient, and that is a very dangerous situation for a patient, because when you are immobilized, and I think many of the late onset patients will know, then you don't use your muscles, and at that moment you have a very big risk in losing the abilities you have. But happily enough, after that operation, there is still, there's once again, an increase in the muscle strength. This is what we call the gross motor function measure. And that is a test which measures all kinds of skills, whether you can roll over, whether you can sit, whether you can walk, or whether you can uh, sit on your knees and lift your arms. It's all kinds of that kind of tests. And here this also was part of the GMFM. <clears throat> In the moderately affected patients, once again, there was a significant increase in the gross motor function measure, and even now, at about 100 weeks of treatment, we are at 100% of the scale, so we cannot score more. And in this patient, the severely affected patient, it more or less remained the same. So despite some increase of muscle function, it's very difficult to show that in the GMFM. And here, what's happened in the other patient is some increase, then the operation, and now it starts come back. Important was this. Um, the both severely affected patients had a very limited pulmonary function. And you, if you look at this slide, you see that it here starts treatment. This is before treatment. And these are the weeks, the number of weeks before and after treatment. And you see before start of the treatment, there was a process of deterioration of pulmonary function to very low levels in both patients to below 20% of normal. And after the start of the trial, the process of deterioration has stopped. And there's even some tendency to improvement. But I think the most important thing is that we demonstrated that there is a significant change in the course. That's significant. And um, there is still, I have to say, still a very limited pulmonary function, but the deterioration seems to have stopped. Has stopped. This is in the best performing patients. He had still a rather good pulmonary function. This is what you hear are the volume in milliliters here, the weeks of treatment. And where does the treatment start? Somewhere here. And you see, it, it seems like he's in the process of deterioration, but I, I don't know it for sure. Most of the values are between uh, <coughs> both the upper and lower limit of normal. And it's a little bit more significant in the uh, lying position. It's always more difficult for patients to breathe in a lying position than in a sitting position. And there you see this. The CK level decreased in all. Um, to show you exactly what, what happened in the patient, maybe some, some videotape that helps. You saw this videotape of the patients at start. And we asked the patients, what did the patient expect from the trial? And this patient uh, mentioned, in fact, that he didn't expect too much from the trial but that he hoped that he would stabilize because he had nothing to lose. And indeed, this patient was very severely affected. And this is what his reaction now is after about 100 weeks of treatment. He said, yes, the trial has been beneficial to me. Before start, I was only up for five hours a day, two and a half hours in the morning and two and a half hours in the evening. I did not have the energy to do anything or go out with my family. Now I get up at 8.45 a.m., have breakfast, take a shower, do some exercise, and after lunch I rest from 3 to 5 p.m. and then stay up till 10 p.m. I have much more energy and I visit friends, have dinners in the restaurant, and even went to the movie. And the most important thing he mentioned, now I see a future. Hope was gone before start of the trial. Here is the patient 
going out with his family to an amusement park. He was not able to do so before the trial, so for him, he regained social function in his life. I want to stress that at the start of the trial, I did not ex really expect myself that we would fer do very much in the patient because he was very severely affected. And of course, there are not very big things happening. I, I already showed you earlier in, in the test results that for the patient, it made an important difference. And I want to show you the patient here doing some training. It's just he has more energy and feels a little bit better and can do some can play with his child, for example. And here you see the patient. He's still, of course, wheelchair bound. His function in his legs is still very limited. But also the physical therapist is saying here that he's able to do more. Just yeah, put on his, his shirt, for example, or fasten a button or so. And this uh, is the second reaction. I hope that the enzyme would make me better. What I mean is that it would enable to have a normal life, a life where I was able to do more than sit-ups for a few months and, a and occasionally go out to eat. And that's the reaction of Tiffany, but I leave it, Tiffany, to you at the end to tell something about it. And then the last patient, the patient that was moderately affected, and his big hope was that he could walk again and here the patient at baseline. You saw the videotape, but I show it again. And this is the patient after 72 weeks of treatment. What you see is that, that the patient walks on his toes because he, has, he had contractions of his Achilles tendons. And uh, when he improved so, so well, we decided to operate him on his Achilles tendons. And this is now the result 96 weeks after start of treatment. One more. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> there is a therapy that works, but we still try to find a balance and uh, and try to get steady ground under the project and i hope that we all will have the power and together with the industry to get as soon as possible a therapy for all your patients on the market this is the team in rotterdam and i would like to add to the team dr shapiro who is currently taking care of tiffany and i would also like to thank dr bob jacobson and dr sean C from at the Mayo Clinic, who also took care of Tiffany for a while. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for some very, very uh, dramatic and demonstrations of proof of principle and most uh, encouraging sign. I'm sure there are lots of questions.
And then I, I, I just saw a big monster by, by the sides, and then, then I, I tried to scare me. I'm, I'm supposed to hear, be here to interpret that, but uh, yeah. I guess I'll throw it over to Anne. So do you, yes. Can you answer that question? It's, it scares you, but what scares you? Did you, did you what's ex maybe your father can help a little. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> Marilyn. to get there. I think that uh, statement uh, was in a, uh, uh, a written statement as a reaction to some discussion on the internet and we corrected that statement uh, and I think you can see uh, why. On the other hand, um, I think we, as, as we all uh, probably agree, we have a long way to go and that was probably more uh, what the statement should have reflected. So, with that, uh, I'll turn it over. I think the key um, from the presentations today that we have seen is that all the enzyme forms that have been uh, used in patients have shown uh, clear uh, results. And I think, uh, as, I, as I keep saying, and I will keep saying that through this meeting, that um, together we have a long way to go. Um, we have uh, seen a lot today, and I think it's extremely encouraging. And I don't want to make any um, comparisons between enzymes. I think it is up to uh, a lot of experts that are working in this field. Are you going to compare the enzyme? Or are you going to only go with the enzyme that you think is the best? Is there a comparison between the data? And why can't we start with something that maybe isn't as great as potential, but that people could have available to them in a shorter period of time? I'm not sure. It's up to me today to uh, react to this, I think what we will do as Genzyme is continue to support these studies, continue to make enzyme in different forms until we have all the answers. And I think that's probably, that's probably the best I can say today. That there would not be any further data collection. As moderator here, it would seem to me that, um, and as a scientist, it would seem to me that uh, that at the moment we have a number of different preparations of enzyme available. Uh, we have some animal models uh, that are fairly consistent in the way that they uh, demonstrate their pathology. One obvious experiment to do would be to evaluate uh, all preparations of enzyme in the one model. But um, I, you know, I, I can understand um, Genzyme's position here where they have a number of preparations uh, on the go. And um, the, the issue that we're all talking about today is the evaluation of these different forms of enzymes in different clinical trials in different patients. And you would have appreciated today that um, there is considerable variation in patients, how they present. This is this spectrum of presentation that we see in Pompey patients. And therefore, to compare patients, um, 
uh, between trials with different enzyme preparations, it is not possible to do very accurately. And that's why we're tending to focus on the differences. And as a moderator here, I would suggest that we should also focus very strongly on the very powerful effects that we've seen today uh, that encourage, um, would, would encourage both Genzyme and the scientists and the clinicians to keep this work going uh, very, very um, quickly uh, to get to an end point where Enzyme is going to be available to everybody. But I don't want to steal. I think that that is an excellent uh, summary. And uh, I just want to also uh, draw your attention to the difficulties uh, to make this product. I think it's very easy to, to think that this can be done uh, quickly and easily. Uh, I can guarantee you that we're doing everything possible to make all these forms of enzymes as needed. Uh, obviously, um, we have to make some choices as the world goes forward. And what I'm looking forward to is to get the help from the experts in this world, including the regulatory experts, to make it possible to bring this forward to patients as quickly as we can. I think that's probably the very, very best I can say today. And I think it is very important that we continue with this meeting today, although there were some problems along the way, because this is the first time that this group in the United States has had that actually want to take it apart in another, in another part of the world. Although we are all uh, linked by uh, uh, computers and whatever, it's still like a million miles from us. You had no idea of what the effects were of the transgenic trial. We had no idea of what the effects were of the show trial because we had never been privy to any of this information. So I think it's very important that we all know and that we're all aware that none, none of this could have happened by chance. It couldn't have happened to my daughter or to the little boy that was lost in the end. And so there is some very good evidence here that this is a, a good treatment. Now, whether the next treatment is better or not, no one can say. I doubt it's making sense. No one's been tested in But as I see it, we are always back to step one again. We are back to the initial um, trial. We never seem to get to the mass. There, there are a number of complicated issues here, if I could uh, just uh, talk to this very briefly. And they include getting enough enzyme of the right type um, to maximize the benefit to the patients. Uh, and the point that you asked, Marilyn, about whether or not um, you could see this um, progression uh, where you go from obvious, very severe pathology, clinical pathology, to less severe clinical pathology. I think this has been an FDA um, uh, argument over the years. We must show that this doesn't happen, and therefore we need to have either very good natural history studies or many controls within, within our trials. And um, uh, in my experience, I think with lysosomal storage disorders, you certainly don't see the uh, progression uh, going backwards towards normal function to, to such a dramatic extent to the principle that we've seen today. Now, um, I'd like to take um, uh, advice from, uh, I guess, the houses about what the program is going to be as far as timing is concerned, because we did intend to have um, the three clinical speakers up here at the front okay, uh, addressing your, your questions. Well, I think maybe we'll, um, uh, uh, to me it seems that we have a, a situation where um, there are a number of patients being treated. They're all individuals. Uh, they all have their own genetic makeup and their own personal natural history of how the disease is affecting them. And they've been put into a trial with limited number of uh, patients to be uh, put against. And we're trying to compare a lot of uh, different things. Um, so it's not surprising that we do have some issues from this morning, but I'd like perhaps uh, if I could hand the microphone 
going from um, my left uh, to right, um, and perhaps uh, each one of the, um, the speakers can perhaps comment about how they saw the issues from this morning's sessions. Lars? There's a microphone right there. There's a microphone right there on the table. Well, thank you again. Um, I think all in, or seeing it as a whole, um, I think there's no doubt that results are very encouraging, um, seeing the trials all together. But of course, I do see the problems that you all kept in mind, asking questions about, well, the heart's getting smaller, what about the rest of the patient? and how are things all going, or how will things proceed? And I think this will be uh, well, the question that we'll, we'll be asking uh, over and over again, uh, all the time. And I think um, it'll be very important also, uh, for example, for me, talking to the patients, talking to the parents, um, getting uh, a good view uh, of the legal process, of what's, what's happening, and um, I would, uh, yeah, urge also, I would also urge the companies, uh, the pharmacological companies, to, to provide an insight as much as they can do and really pass it on to us, also give us help in passing on this information to the parents and to the patients because that's, the, that's really one of the issues we're talking about uh, from a day-to-day -day basis on the ward together with the patients. Now before the next uh, speaker, is there any comments on that particular um Comment. I think that the simple idea that when you make a new drug that the problems will go away is too good to be true. And this is as proven the case as well. I mean, it's too good to be true that everything goes away when you have just one drug, uh, one specific thing, and then just bam, it's all gone. But it has moved forward, and it's moving forward in a rapid way. Um, I understood that to bring out a completely new drug, a drug which is a new class of drugs, it's not a modification of something that's existing, typically takes 10 to 15 years to go from concept to actual drug. And it looks like it's going at the same rate or even a little bit faster than that. So I'm actually encouraged that we have resolved issues like the cardiomyopathy, but every time you go over one stage, you see the next problems ahead of you. And I'm I like it that data are coming out. How the interpretation is, is then open to different interpretations and people can comment that what's essential is that the actual raw data come out and then we can try and solve the next question and the next problem ahead of us. And I'm, I'm encouraged, encouraged with what's happened. I mean, I think there is a lot of good things that have come out. I think the next thing to do is ask the right questions. You just mentioned that it was about 15 years for a new drug to come out. A and completely new class of drug. A new class of drug. And this enzyme therapy that began with the transgenic, which started, what, 94, 93? I think both, both uh, the Rotterdam and, and, and Duke group started out somewhere around the early 1990s. I would place the Duke development of a Cho enzyme in, in September of 92. Okay. Then realistically, and I think that's something that hasn't been given to the patients is the realistic timeline. And if you're saying that, you know, if we took it in a realistic sense from the point of an initiation of this new drug of 15 years, we're still looking at a few more years versus the last two or three years, we've been told next year, next year, next year. I think the closer, you, the closer you come, the less predictable it gets. Could, could I insert myself in here because I think it's a bit rough on um, my clinical colleagues up the front here to answer those questions. Perhaps it's a very good uh, question to ask of the, of the company representatives, uh, which will follow up after uh, the FDA person has spoken. But it is a very serious um, uh, timeline issue that you ask. Are there any other comments uh, before uh, Anne speaks? Okay. <clears throat> I think I said 
already a lot this morning, and I think I already made my cl best clear, so I keep it short. I think the main message is, is that we have a promising drug uh, at hand, or coming up, and I think we have to join the forces together with the companies and the researchers to get it a working drug, a drug that is good for the patient uh, on, on the market so that you can have it all. I, I've certainly talked too much too, but I agree. I, I think we all stand here, I mean, I'm in my lab, but we're at the clinic, we're all trying to figure out how are we gonna get this as quickly as possible to as many, uh, many people as possible. Um, what we've chosen to do at Duke is we chose a per certain patient population that we could use the least amount of enzyme to get the most amount of information out that we could possibly take that info to some place like the FDA and say, is this enough? Are you gonna license this and approve it for these people? Because once that happens, then the companies can go full blast and make as much enzyme as they need for everybody. But until then, they can't invest that kind of, they can't make that kind of investment because it's always gonna be a gamble, what if it doesn't get licensed? Because then they don't have any protection, they don't have, uh, they don't know if they're gonna get their return back. So we're all trying to just push ahead Minimal amounts of enzyme we're pushing as quick as, if we had more enzyme, there'd be more patients being treated. I, there's no doubt. There's no way we'd be shelving this stuff. A Andy, just to be a little bit provocative, haven't you got enough evidence now to show you that uh, at least proof of no. principle is going to work? I don't think so. I, I, I could be a devil's advocate here. I, 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 I tell you, ANSA's work, uh, in the, especially, the, I think the infantile stuff, we have a lot of similarities or some differences. The juvenile work I saw, is incredibly dramatic. Is that enough? I don't think so. I, if I were standing outside, I could come in and say, uh, well, how do you know that maybe it was because this child was in the hospital being seen by doctors regularly that maybe this showed this improvement? I mean, I don't believe that. I'm not, I don't believe that at all. I believe what you, you present. But other people that look outside from, let's say, a, a monitoring group could legitimately argue that. And so what you need is enough data in enough people with controls that you know that this person would have done this at the end, that there's no question, that's when you'll be able to get it approved. And that's what we're all working for is to design those trials to get there. Now, I know the results are dramatic, I believe them. I'm just telling you that in order to get a license and to convince other people, you have to leave no stone unturned. You can't leave a little wiggle room there because then you're gonna be stuck. You have to go back to the drawing board, you lose time. I'm a doctor and a scientist. I'm a scientist. I'm a scientist, and I'll tell you, in, uh, I've seen it happen in muscular dystrophy, where people claim that there are improvements. I believe this. I'm not telling you I don't believe what I see. I'm just saying that others have attacked it and used scientific grounds to argue it. You have to, be, you have to make sure that no stone is left unturned. That's Andy, what I'm saying. I, I fully agree, but do you believe in your own results and the results you have seen? Uh, I've seen the results. I, I do believe in all what I've seen. If I would have been a doctor and if this medicine would have been on the shelf, I would have prescribed it on the basis of what I've seen. That's true. So why would you speak for companies? I because mean, I've companies seen the history. For their I mean, own. You need enough data pooled together with, an, there's, there's questions you see between these two groups about differences in design that maybe someone could say, well, they did this a little different. That's why they got this result and others get a different result. But I it's, think it's not that easy. I think the issue here really is that there are a number of stations on the way from uh, having the thought that enzyme therapy is going to work and uh, getting it licensed by the FDA to market it for all patients. And what I think uh, some of us are suggesting is that uh, we're well down the track, we're past a number of stations, we're certainly past the station of proving um, that uh, proof of principle here. And uh, if you needed any more evidence that this is going, going to work or not going to work, I think that is really just slowing the, the train down the track. And what we really need to do is perhaps move on to the next stage. And to do that, you're going to need much more enzyme. And I'm hoping that uh, the company representatives can deal with those questions uh, in the next session. I, I agree. Now, I just there was a hand that went up right up the back.
Marilyn, I, I wonder if we could uh, put that on the table for when um, John and Jan are up here. Um, after we've heard the FDA address, I'm not sure where that is in the planning stage. I believe it was rewritten, being rewritten on a computer somewhere outside. Does anyone know where, where we are with that presentation? Because I think... Yes, but have we got it on the computer, ready to go? I'm, call, I'm calling that office right now. Okay. Um, Answer. I, well, I'd say not, not exactly, no. That's what this venue is for, is to help us share. Uh, it's unfortunately the scientific portion of the meeting didn't come off. We all hold it individually. I mean, and then, but we can't wait. Could I take could I take both all of these questions? I think on behalf of uh, the four people here, just just initially to get some further discussion going. But to me, um, I would just like to remind people that, as far as I know, the merger or the uh, the acquisition of Genzyme and uh, and the merger of Novozyme into Genzyme is a fairly recent occurrence. And um, and I think uh, the nature of the process has been fairly uh, fairly recent. And I would, uh, and I think we can ask the representatives when they, they're up st standing up here about uh, their timelines and, and how the data between all of the trials that are going on now under the, the, uh, the Genzyme umbrella are going to be uh, communicated. And I would imagine that there'll be a very good infrastructure put in place, but it'd be interesting for me to hear what that infrastructure is going to be and how uh, the you know discussion between the various groups that are having trials uh, is going to be managed, but I think they're very good questions, and we've got the people here uh, to give us direct answers, and they're on after uh, the FDA address. Randall. Well, perhaps if we could move it, move the uh, the Genzyme Novozyme uh, part of the program ahead to now. Unless there's some particular questions about the uh, the clinical results that we heard this morning, but I think we're we've used our half an hour on uh, on that particular activity now. But if there are any pressing issues, please, uh, while the other two speakers are coming to the front, ask them. Aren't, aren't there precedent situations when a product is approved by the FDA, but then a later amendment comes in with a proper, where the product is improved? You know, but the existing product comes out, and then in the future, an improvement occurs. And so they, they go forward with the existing product. Or is it such that the financial investment would cost so much that that's not feasible to do? Is that, a, is that a, an issue? I'd answer it, it depends on how different the product is. The FDA would say, how much is it different that will determine uh, how much more scrutiny or how much less scrutiny it will determine. Is it a brand new drug? Is it a different angle on the same disease? That's, that's gonna, it, it all depends. I, that, that's my answer. 
I think that some of these modifications are probably looking at, uh, I know the FDA people, the regulatory people in Genzyme and, uh, are, are considering this in, in all their options, based on what I've heard. But again, I think this is for the next two yeah. sessions. Are there questions about the clinical results from this morning? Otherwise, we'll move on. When the next stage of clinical tests will begin for the adult onset? It's That's a company question also? I think, yeah. oh. it's your question I think we need the companies up the front. Yeah. <laughs> we've, we've milked all the clinical ones. soon so oh, go ahead yeah I don't know if you want to begin with just yeah, a brief introduction and then I could kind of let's give my um, chat. begin let's keep it informal um, obviously we are happy that uh, we are here so we can answer as many questions uh, as you have um, I think this morning was uh, an extremely important morning it was an extremely encouraging morning and I would like all of us, um, even if there are questions, even if there are differences of opinion, to remember that the progress that has been made over the last more than 10 years, really, um, is to the point where a lot of the questions can, can be answered. And I think when you ask every individual investigator, uh, they probably don't want to do anything more than get together and talk about all the questions talk about all the results so that everybody can understand it. And as I said earlier, uh, it's the commitment uh, that Genzyme, Genzyme makes to make that possible. And I think we're now in a better position than, than actually ever before, just now since last week, since the merger between Genzyme and Novozyme closed, to be able to share uh, information, ideas, data, and start to rapidly work our way through all the different things that are on the table. Obviously, the regulatory process is a very, very complex one. And that isn't only the case here. That is the case for every single product. Genzyme has um, experienced now since a while the first product we brought to market for the lysosomal storage disease area was for Gaucher disease. When you go back to that clinical trial, it was a very simple clinical trial, six patients. Ever since, the world has changed drastically, I would say. And the next uh, product that Genzyme has been working on is a product for Fabry disease. And for you that follow the developments there, this program has been going on and on and on. We've done many clinical trials. The company that competes with us has done several clinical trials. We both believe that we have shown the agencies that these products are safe and effective. And nevertheless, uh, they are not approved at this point. So these processes are very complex. What I can say here today is that we are committed to move forward rapidly with a lot of uh, drive. This is um, certainly from Genzyme's perspective, the highest priority <coughs> in the company. And after the merger with Novozyme, for whom this program also is the highest priority, you can believe uh, that we will put the combined efforts to work. What I would like to do maybe is uh, introdu introduce John. Uh, many of you know John. Uh, John was the CEO of Novozyme. John and I have had many discussions over the last 12 months. And despite the fact that we were, in a sense, competing, 
at the end of the day, we felt the interest would be best served by combining the companies and move together and move forward together. So John, if you want to talk about the plans that Novozyme uh, as an independent company has developed, and then afterwards I would suggest um, we take questions and answers and I would be happy to take them and uh, if I may ask the help of the different speakers before to answer some of the questions and I can direct it around the, the room, um, I'm sure we can we can have a very productive uh, discussion. Uh, I, you know, a couple of things I would like to, and I, if it's okay, I think everybody can probably hear me without a, a microphone. My wife says everyone usually can, so we'll, we'll proceed on that basis until somebody else tells me otherwise. Um, you know, a couple of things I'd like to cover in just a very brief period of time. One is to just give everybody a bit of a history. Oh, okay. All right. And I still promise I won't sing, so that's okay. Um, just a couple of things. What I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about the history of Pompeii disease drug development, just to get everybody grounded on the same area. And I'll do that very briefly, focusing on the area that I know best, Novozyme. Talking a little bit about this Genzyme-Novozyme merger, because like many of you, if you had told me a year ago, John, you're going to have a Genzyme name tag whenever, and be able to walk around Boston and get in their offices, I would have thought, that you're, first of all, you're crazy, and second of all, you know, why would I ever want to do that? But I'm going to try to explain why we've done this and why I think it's so positive. Uh, the second thing I'd like to do is to talk specifically about our drug development programs, timelines, resources, the people working on it, what some of our results have been, what some of our thinking is to work together going forward, uh, and then maybe just a, a, a couple of personal comments on the, the drive and dedication and vision that we have for the program. Uh, before I do it, it, I know it's been said once or twice, but I want to thank Randall and Marilyn for all they've done over the years and for all they've done to put this meeting together. And from here, moving forward. And for your persistence this week in taking us all here uh, as in, in the best way we could, uh, despite all the, the, the tragedies and traumas for so, so much of the world in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and then likewise, too, to thank all the doctors, and this is as much from my professional side as my personal side, uh, to the, all the doctors who have done so much over the years, and it's great to see them, and I wish we could see more here today, and I'm sure in the future we'll see more, but to, you know, to Dr. Vonderplug, Dr. Reuser, names that I only read about a couple of years ago, Dr. Amaflatano, Chen, Sloanum, all those great people, uh, and, and just as a footnote, be glad that it wasn't Andy or one of his relatives who discovered this disease, or us or our children would all now have Amaflatano syndrome, so. <laughs> But in many respects, you know, there's a lot of talk these days about heroes. And in, in my view, in the view of everyone in this room, you guys are the heroes doing the work who have taken us so far and will take us to that next level. So that's, that, that said there, a bit on just the history of how, how we've come to it. And let me begin, much of you know and much has been said about the history of drug development in Pompeii disease, beginning with the first clinical trial in 1973 where they tried to take enzyme purified from a human placenta. And it was enzyme that was catalytically active, meaning it was the right protein. It could break down glycogen in little Petri dishes. And they took it from human placenta, purified it, and injected it into a baby. And the kid died a couple of weeks later. Uh, and it didn't work. It was a failure. And it was thought for years that enzyme therapy for Pompeii patients just isn't a viable alternative. But people like Arnold kept pressing forward and saying, no, I think we could do this. And other folks in the area kept pressing forward to learn more and more and just build on what the previous doctors before them had learned. And that led to farming and their discoveries and the ability to make medicine out of rabbit milk, which is a first great discovery uh, in the whole field of transgenics. You know, and remember, not one single drug has ever been approved made from milk of any animals. And they will be someday. But no drug has been approved made in that way. We take it all the way forward to all the work that's been done over the years by Y.T. Chen and Andy and Priya and their folks at Duke University, sometimes sponsored by different companies. You know, we've heard Synpac, Farming, Genzyme, Novozyme, lots of companies involved. And you take it forward to just a year and a half ago when, uh, you know, we had done some, some fundraising for the Pompeii Foundation when, uh, as, as I think all of you know, my two kids 
Patrick, who's now three and a half, and Megan, who's four and a half, were diagnosed with Pompeii disease. And like Randall and Marilyn, we wanted to do everything we could do to help try to drive science toward a cure. And we all took lots of different paths to get where we are today. Uh, but we have a clear vision going forward. You know, 18 months ago, Bill Canfield, who is a glycobiologist, a guy who doesn't treat patients with Pompeii disease or lysosomal storage diseases, he focuses on the glycobiology, the carbohydrate chains attached to the proteins, and that's his area of expertise. And he's got some really neat discoveries for how we tweak this, and he wanted to start a company. In fact, he actually, first he wanted to give it to big bio and big pharmaceutical companies, but they weren't interested, and he came to me and asked, with my interest, if I'd help him start a business. And with five people and not a whole lot of money, a year and a half ago, we started that company in Oklahoma City. And I continue to live in New Jersey and travel almost weekly out to Oklahoma City, which is a great place for any of you who haven't been there, and I've told many patients this today. Uh, lots of exciting stuff, lots of great research. There are now 90 people at Novozyme, 70 of whom are scientists based in Oklahoma City. You all have an open invitation. Come visit, take a tour, see what we're doing, talk to Dr. Canfield, learn about what we're doing. It's one approach, not the only approach, maybe not the right approach, but it's one approach and some very dedicated scientists out there. That led us to this summer where there were a couple of programs in progress and then really there were only two companies, the Farming Genzyme Alliance and Novozyme. Uh, and at that point, we began to talk, and Jan, much, much to his credit, and I'm not just saying that because he's my new boss, but much to his credit, said, why don't we just put this all together? This is stupid to beat each other up over this. And we weren't beating each other up. Both of us had the view that Novozyme's not the enemy, Genzyme's not the enemy, Rotterdam's not, Duke's not. It's the disease, it's the glycogen. We have to beat the disease. How do we do it together? It took a while to get us there to convince all kinds of people involved in the process that it's the right thing to do, but Bill Canfield and I became convinced after talking to Jan, talking to Henry Tremere, who's the CEO at Genzyme, that they really, people at Genzyme really, really wanted to find the answer. How do we do it together? So that's what led to this merger. When we think of yeah, the success Novozyme has had in the past at just getting into a preclinical stage, mean, meaning treating animals, how do I take that into the clinic and start treating patients? You know, by ourselves, we probably could have done okay treating 10 or 20, but we don't want to treat 10 or 20. You know, together we want to treat thousands of patients. And what it would have taken to do that would have taken time, and money and effort and everything else. And you know, we know we'll beat nature in this battle. We have to beat time. And because of that, Bill Canfield and I stood up to our investors and lots of other people and said, we want to partner with Genzyme. Genzyme convinced their board it's the right thing to do, and that's what led to the merger. And I know there's lots of questions about what the implications of that are. But let me tell you, what underlies it all is, is the very sincere belief that we want to work together, we want to break down walls, we want to bring the Andes and Ans of the world together, the Bill Canfields, Arnold Reusers, these are the people with the minds to solve these problems. And at Genzyme and Novozyme, what we're going to do is facilitate that. Now, let me move a little bit to specific drug development programs, and I'll begin first by discussing the Novozyme program. The Novozyme drug is the same protein, protein meaning enzyme, as the farming protein, as the Synpac Genzyme protein. They differ all a little bit in their carbohydrate structures. And what we're all trying to get a grasp on is what's the significance of those carbohydrate differences. We've shown, and it's been published in, in, in animal studies, that the Novozyme drug, at least in vitro and in some animal studies, has done tremendously well to be taken up, to be taken up at very low dosages with potentially lower side effects, at least in the animals. Uh, lots more to be done on that front. Uh, it, is, it is not as far advanced in clinical development as ANZA's program or Andy and YT's program. But what Genzyme has given us the commitment to do is to take that program forward, to rapidly put it into kids and to see what it does. Because ultimately, these are very experimental treatments. We all have a hypothesis for what it should or shouldn't do, but we've got to get them into kids. Stop the progression of their disease and see how much we can reverse. So the first part is we have a Novozyme trial, and it's with a specific drug that Novozyme has made with this unique carbohydrate structure. Where we are there, we have just about completed our animal studies. We've got about three more months of animal studies. We need to determine dosing. We need to determine exactly how the drug gets to where it's at. We need to make sure it's safe. 
and the FDA has told us when you get to the 13-week point in that trial, then you could begin treating kids if it shows the things that the FDA wants to show. But when we have a constant dialogue with the FDA about what they want to see. Uh, so we don't, we don't get to the point where we present the data, we're ready to go into humans, we've made the drug, and the FDA says, well, no, you know, what we really need to see is X, Y, and Z, and we've got to start over. So we're having that dialogue. The other part, and the very complex part, is making this drug. I came out of the pharmaceutical industry, and I could tell you this drug, these drugs, are among the most complex, if not the most complex, biologics ever made in the industry. It takes a long time to make these drugs. Uh, it takes, from start to finish, about six months to make a batch to treat a small number of kids. So we are in the process, we're about halfway through the manufacturing process at, uh, in Oklahoma City making the Novozyme drug. We expect by the end of this year that that manufacturing process will be complete. We also have a medical team that's working again with the FDA to design a clinical study. Uh, and we're still working through our thinking internally and with the agency about what the right design for that study will be. It will likely be a study in children, probably a broader range of children than the design of some other studies. Uh, it will likely be somewhere between 10 and 20 patients. We're still, our doctors are still trying to figure that out. And we would anticipate beginning that study sometime early next year. Uh, the other part, you know, I have now two jobs, essentially. I continue to run Novozyme as the president of Novozyme. And then uh, I've also been named within the Genzyme organization to lead all Pompeii teams. And this, this is why I think this merger is really, really such a, a great event for all of us in this room. Because we're finally going to be able to have leadership and vision, and not from me, from lots of people. And if I can help facilitate it, terrific. And take the resources and experience of Genzyme and all the clinicians you've heard from, and not start back from scratch but to build on what we've learned from these other programs, work to design the best pivotal study that we can to support getting the drug out to as many patients as quickly as possible. Uh, I'm just now learning the merger just closed two days ago. I spent the last two days up in Boston. So I'm just starting now to understand all the, the data, the strategies, the uh, manufacturing issues, regulatory issues, both US and international. But I've got the commitment from the top folks at Genzyme to take the best people, the best and the brightest, from Novozyme and Genzyme, manufacturing, medical, regulatory, and put them on a team. And let's figure it out together. And with that said, I'm going down to Duke next Friday, and I'm taking a half a dozen Novozyme and Genzyme people with me, and we're going to listen and learn. And likewise, I promise you, within the next couple of weeks, we will be out in Europe, and we'll listen and learn and build on what's been done uh, to move forward. You know, just on a on a personal, I'll tell you a quick little story. I know lots of you know a little bit or maybe not much at all about, about my kids. They're both ventilator dependent. Uh, they, uh, Patrick is, is a really weak little kid. He's three and a half years old and can only move his hands. Uh, Megan is a little bit stronger. If you sit her up, she could sit there and she's got an amazing amount of feistiness to her. She's a, a remarkable little kid. Um, she's ventilator dependent too. Just started to go to preschool just to let you know the passion and dedication that not just me, I, I hope all of you believe it from me, but everybody at Novozyme, and I believe everyone at Genzyme too, approaches this problem. And we're just going to continue to drill it into people that this is a real life situation, that people suffer and die every day without these drugs. And we've got scientists that work around the clock. We've got 24 seven shifts at our manufacturing plant. There's not one day off, not Christmas off for our manufacturing people. Let me just tell you this quick little story, and I told it to everyone at Novozyme. I took my daughter, Megan, in with her wheelchair one day on a Sunday a couple of weeks ago to my office in Princeton. Now, remember, all of our research and development is in Oklahoma City. All of my offices, patient advocacy, a number of folks you people talk to, and my medical group is in Princeton. Uh, I can't take Megan to Oklahoma City because she can't fly on an airplane, but I could take her into Princeton. She'd never been to Daddy's work, so I took her in and was wheeling her around, and we took her upstairs uh, up in the elevator, and. She, had, she talks in sign language because of the weakness of the muscles in her mouth. She can't speak. And she talked to us in sign language, and she asked me, where's Dr. Canfield's office? And Bill's actually got a tiny little office in the corner there. He's not in New Jersey much. Thankfully, we keep him in the labs in Oklahoma doing his job. Yeah, so I said, well, it's over here, honey. And she said in sign language, I want to see. I said, OK. We, we wheeled her in. And then she was looking around, and she said, is that his desk in sign language? And I said, yeah. 
And then again, in sign, she says, I want to sit behind it. I said, okay, figured she's a regular four-year-old kid, likes to play office, that's fine. And she sat there, and I was kind of only half paying attention to her, and she started opening the drawers. And I said, Megs, I said, what are you doing? And as serious as she could be, she said in sign language to me, where's the special medicine? And, you know, part of me laughed because she's such a shrewd little kid. <laughs> she just thought maybe Daddy won't notice if I pick up a vial. And then part of me wanted to cry. You know, and that's what I hear every day. Every day. Times two. And that's the commitment that we have at Novozyme. And it's that type of commitment that we're going to make sure we have at Genzyme, taking it forward. So... That's where we are. I could tell you, six months ago, there was one plant in the world making this enzyme. In the last 12 weeks, there are now three. One in Oklahoma City, one at Genzyme in Boston, and we've even rented a facility from another company up in Syracuse, all making different versions of the drug to help us figure out in the clinic to get the data to find out what's the best drug. So, you know, that's as specific as we could be. I could tell you going forward, we're just now thinking literally, we've, we've renamed the project internally the Pompeii Project, with my combined Genzyme, Novozyme teams, the Manhattan Project. And we've done that for two reasons. One, to reflect the urgency and the time. And the second is to reflect the importance of what we do. So just bear with us a little bit longer. We're just over the next couple of weeks putting our plans and programs together, working with some really smart and dedicated people. Uh, and let's, from this day forward, let's go forward together, please, together. So I will answer any question, and Jan will answer any question you guys have. That is one of the opportunities that we now definitely have, and <clears throat> even though we haven't completely finalized the plans, how we combine all this and go forward, you would assume that that is a very logical uh, step. And uh, let's start with the most logical pieces, and let's pull, as we said, the people together that have been working on this. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of discussion. It's clear that uh, <clears throat> everybody has ideas, and we need to figure out a, a forum where all these ideas can come forward. Um, That's not idea. too much and not too long, because speed is of the essence. We're, I mean, Nina's for half a year had uh, varying access since we've continued to make our enzyme uh, at the NIH. Um, and it's something we're just planning internally. In fact, that's my Wednesday 3 p.m. meeting to get Elvira, who's our, uh, Elvira, Dr. Ponce, who's our director of preclinical studies, together with the director of preclinical studies at Genzyme, and internally to begin to do that. And Nina, we'd be happy to work with you to, to find the, you know, we just want to find the best answer. I don't care if it's the Novozyme drug. I don't care which drug it is. Let's figure out what the best answer is. I'm really very pleased if, if this now can be, can be done because, as you know, I've been asking for one and a half year for this comparison, and it was always refused. And uh, apparently something has changed now so that these things can be done. And I'll be the first one to say, finally, yes, thank you. Uh, and I'll definitely uh, like to participate in this, yes. Good, good. I mean, look, the data may be ambiguous. That's the nature of science. but. 
let's let no, the data. I think let's we get the data and figure it out. Together, we'll we'll find it. Yeah, no, I think that's it's smart. It's clear that, uh, and and I think this is a good place to say it because so many people are here that <coughs> we will uh, we will ask for in the future. Uh, we need we need everybody's support, and at the end of the day, obviously we need to make decisions uh, that will not always be simple, and we we may have to go against somebody's opinion, but at least what we can do is get as much data and put it in front of people. So there are two issues, of course. The <coughs> the comparison of the, uh, the enzyme preparations in the one animal model in perhaps two independent places. Uh, and that, you know, it's good, great to hear that that is in your plans and it will go ahead and I would hope very soon. But I guess the other issue that people may want to ask about is the nature of the process of, or structure of how you'll have the, the various clinical groups that have been having trials, how they will come together uh, in the very near future because uh, I'm sure that is also uh, well in your planning at uh, this time. Yeah. Maybe if I, if I can open up on that, because obviously we have, as Genzyme now, several clinical groups that are uh, working with, with different products that um, we are supporting. And um, again, I, I see really today as a, as a starting point of many new things. <coughs> Last week, the merger closed. It's two days old. Uh, or two days young, I should say. Um, we have in the joint venture with farming certain uh, things that need to be uh, clarified and need to be um, finalized, uh, mainly in terms of the uh, ongoing production for the clinical trial. Um, once these, these elements are clear, I think it is a lot easier for everybody to, uh, to pull together. Yeah, no, I, I think that's fair. I wouldn't want to get up here right now and say, this is how we're going to do it, because I don't know how we're going to do it. This is part of my learning in the next couple of weeks, what's been done. Roy House, <clears throat> Rochester, Minnesota. Um, I want to commend your spirit, Mr. Crowley, as well as the spirit of all the others here in the room. Uh, uh, for me, it, I think that's one of the most uh, outstanding features of this conference. Uh, some time ago, I read a layman's um, newspaper uh, report uh, regarding some of your work and at the conclusion of the article it talked about the uptake of the enzyme that your company is producing and I think it had something to do with phosphorylation. Could you comment on that? Yeah, I, you know that we've got a website out there that hopefully many of you had visited and uh, as, as we've indicated we just started to think about how do we reach out and try to educate or just keep a line of communication open with patients. So we do plan in the next couple of months to go around the country and town hall meetings and just laying out as best we can our plans and, and data. But the concept of phosphorylation is if, if you think about really three key parts to the drug, you've got the base protein, that's kind of the business end. That's what breaks down the glycogen, that's what we need. Everything else is what directs it toward the lysosome of the cell where it needs to get to. That's the carbohydrate chain. And that's what Dr. Canfield's expertise is in. He did his PhD in lysosomal enzyme uptake by manipulating carbohydrates. And what he's done is to discover a couple of key processing enzymes that our bodies use to naturally manipulate these carbohydrates. Uh, so you've got the, the, the business end, the protein. You've got the carbohydrate chain. And then attached to it are phosphate molecules. We represent them usually graphically by little p's. And if you remember, I think it was e even in uh, Arnold's first presentation this morning, he talked about the little blue nubs on the, on the cell, cell surface wall. Those are called mannose-6-phosphate receptors. And those receptors are usually found on the inside of a cell. And in, normally, lysosomal enzymes never leave a cell. They're made in one compartment, transported to another, and then eventually taken to the lysosome, where for most of us, for all of us, without the disease in this room, that's how it works. What we're trying to do is something unnatural, all of us. And that's to get the body to accept it from the bloodstream. So as Arnold said, you've got to get it out of the bloodstream, cross the blood vessel wall, cross the cell membrane, and then get into the lysosome. So what Dr. Canfield has done is to be, develop a series of technologies to take that enzyme in our lab and add whatever carbohydrate structure we want to it. And what we've been able to do is to add a carbohydrate structure that we, we think we know 
most closely mimics that that's naturally produced within the body. What we don't know is how much of a difference that's going to make in patients. And that's the purpose of the clinical trial. And the mouse studies that uh, Barry Byrne from the University of Florida, who couldn't be here this weekend, uh, what Dr. Byrne's studies had showed was that you could restore normal enzyme activity, that you could break down glycogen, and most significantly, in the mice affected, all of the mice that he tested it on, he ran electrical currents through their soleus muscle, which is a muscle in the foot. And after uh, several weeks of therapy with the Novozyme drug, the strength of those muscles as measured by this force frequency curve was indistinguishable from that of normal animals. So it was pretty significant. It was the first time uh, that Dr. Byrne, or, or I don't know if it's anyone in the field, but certainly with our drug, it had ever been shown that you could reverse neuromuscular damage. Uh, these were younger mice. Uh, mice don't always, people don't always behave the same way as mice do, so lots of open questions that we need to solve. But at least, you know, the, the gist of phosphorylation is to be able to better target the enzyme. Uh, maybe provide better efficacy, hopefully provide a much lower dose for patients. Um, so that, that's the science at, at its core. And we're going to test it and see what it does. Uh, I don't know, Nina. I don't Question know. We was, ask Barry. The question was, are these data going to be published? This is the Florida data. Is they have very right? burned data. I'm not sure, Nina. Are there some questions about um, uh, timelines and uh, company policy about moving things forward that these two gentlemen, I'm sure, would be willing to have a go at? I won't reach that far, Tiffany. No, here, Tiffany, I could come to you and you could, or you want to, here. Trade mics, how about that? Go ahead. Okay, you said that you add stuff to an original protein, right? Different carbohydrates, and that's what phosphorylizing does. Yeah, essentially. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Which original protein are you, are you using? It's the acid alpha. Okay. Can you take like the transgenic enzyme or whatever and phosphorylize that so that it'll work, as you say, better or faster or whatever? Uh, I think that, yeah, yeah I mean, the, the question really is can we take an enzyme that's not the one that Novozyme usually works with and can we add, sprinkle a little bit of our phosphorylation magic to it to maybe better target the enzyme? Um, potentially. That's something we're going to look at. That's one of the experiments that Bill Canfield is going to design. For the show. And what, you know, we're actually, what we would have to do is to do it to the show. Okay, can I just ask something? Sure. Okay, I remember around 1994, 95, we talked to Johan van Hove, and that is what he was talking about, uh, phosphorylation. Is the CHO enzyme phosphorylated now, and also is the transgenic? I've also heard Arnold Ruser talk about that. Can you all answer? We've analyzed them, but Arnold, go ahead. I, I can answer for the transgenic. It is, yes, indeed, phosphorylated. Uh, I don't know to what extent compared to other forms of lysosomal enzymes. Um, we we do have uh, also produced CHO enzyme. And this CHO enzyme is higher phosphorylated than the, uh, the rabbit enzyme. Uh, I have no idea how, how it relates. In, in FIFO experiments, we have seen very little uh, difference between the two preparations. I, yeah, maybe just to comment a little bit. We, we did look at the, the phosphorylation, and it gets real technical, but just basically um, it has to do with how much. I'll try to go back up to the front. So I feel like a talk show host now. So <laughs> That's all right. Um, basically, it has to do with you know, there are certain chains attached to the protein. And some of them can accept these phosphate molecules, and some of them can't. So the first thing you do is figure out which can even accept the phosphate molecules. And of those, what percent of them have the phosphate attached to it? And it's not just the quantity of phosphate, it's the quality. Meaning, does it have just one phosphate, or does it have two? You know, it gets into technical glycobiology. But, you know, when we looked at it, the, uh, the farming protein was somewhere between 5 to 9% of the available sites. Uh, made in the transgenic material was phosphorylated. Novozymes is 100%. We've added all the potential phosphate that we can to it, which doesn't mean to say that we can't take another cell line and just add our, if it gets us there quicker, absolutely we'll do it. You know, if we could take the Duke Cho cell line, take another Cho cell line, uh, and add the phosphate to it, if that gets us there quicker, that's fine. And, and just, I, 
We haven't done the in vivo comparisons of what ultimately, that's what we'll do in humans to compare what the difference is. I can tell you in, in uptake studies we do where you essentially take fibroblasts from patients, Pompeii patients, and compare how readily is the, the enzyme internalized. Uh, ours is internalized about 10 times as much. So. Um, I, I just want to, I think that this discussion is going off into a technical direction. And, and, and Arnold's going to kick my butt if we go there, so be, I'll stop. Be, before we uh, miss our opportunity to talk about the, uh, the commercial uh, policy uh, politics of the whole process, I think if we could bring the discussion back to that area, I think uh, you know, this is the whole part of this session, the need for this session. Yeah, I think that is a, that's, I, I that's a that. very key question. When do people get enzyme? Oh. And um, clearly, what we don't want to do is study things and delay things. I think we want to study them, but with what we know today, we want to move forward. So one of the things that Genzyme has been working on now since, uh, since a while is a, is a process to produce enough uh, CHO material enough to uh, start a trial that will get us through the regulatory approval. And that is where the focus is from the Genzyme side right now. I think on the Novozyme side, uh, you guys are producing enough product to go through a first uh, phase of um, safety uh, studies, but John, you can go into that into more detail. Yeah, I mean, at its core, Let we... Before we do that, I also want to say something to the transgenic material because obviously you've seen very good results, very interesting results with the, cho with the transgenic material and the question has been asked many, many times, so why don't you move that forward and why don't you go faster? And I think the realities of the day are that the manufacturing process is complex and it starts with getting the milk and it ends with the regulatory process. And a while ago, uh, Genzyme and Farming have decided that we would continue the manufacturing of that product to continue to support the ongoing trial. But that the bulk of the, uh, the effort would be focused on manufacturing a CHO-derived material. And that, is, and that is where that stands today. I, I mean, I just comment because, look, to be very, we get, always get the question, why do you move forward with the transgenic? And, and the reason is, it's a production reason. To make the transgenic, you need a lot, a lot of rabbits. Rabbits naturally aren't animals that are milked. Uh, it would take a half a million rabbits to satisfy a couple of thousand Pompeii patients. Uh, even in, just in the, in the small scale process, many rabbits are lost because they get heart attacks, because they get so upset because they're getting milked. So what do you do? You give them value. Well, that's the regulatory agencies don't like that. So, you know, really when you get down to it, yes, an enzyme is not an enzyme, but the base proteins should need to be the same. So when we talk about a CHO-derived material, it's not necessarily fundamentally a different drug. It's got a different carbohydrate chain, but with our technologies, we can all move around the carbohydrate chains. Why we're moving to a CHO is because it's going to get us there faster. The only alter if, if you were dead set on moving forward with a transgenic program, the only way you could do it is to switch to big animals, cows, cattle. That would take two to four years. No, we don't. Because Gen yeah, we are developing uh, other pro products, or I should say, Genzyme transgenics is. Um, in this particular case, given the quantities of the product and given the, um, the stable production that we need very soon, we have made that decision, um, I think it's now over a year ago. And um, at this point, we are uh, doing uh, our very, very best to keep manufacturing with the rabbits uh, that we have. And I think that's our first priority at this point as far as the transgenic program is concerned.
That is not part of uh, the Genzyme farming uh, cooperation at this point, so I don't have the details. Who has the cows, Randall? I've never heard. Who, who does? And they make GAA? The trouble, the trouble we have right now, to be totally honest with you, is that um, we, have to, we have to continue to make what we can make at this point. And I think that is the key for everybody around the world. And to get distracted from there, I think, would not be a service to everybody. To look at the Novozyme program and uh, go through a careful analysis, what the improvements can be from where we are today, I think is the thing that we need to do. If that turns out uh, to take some time and we, need, we can make progress with the existing CHO program, our commitment is to move that forward as rapidly as possible. And then talk about a, uh, call it an improved version as a second, second generation product. The key here, uh, to be very clear to you, is to get these programs through the regulatory process. As long as it is not through the regulatory process, this product will not be available to everybody. And so you can look at all these individual pieces and wonder why we do this, or why we do that, or why we don't do this and don't do that. Right now, it is all geared towards making enough product and putting it through a program so that the regulatory agencies around the world will approve it for everybody. You stated earlier that you have that amount of time to get it through that process. What's the next step? I mean, just a minute ago you said that you did have well, enough enzyme to get it into the regulatory process. Um, I, I'm not sure what I said about that. We have a process ongoing, an effort ongoing to make enough product so that we can, together with the data that has been generated so far by the different, different investigators, pull together a clinical trial program that can get this product approved. And how the clinical trial needs to look, what, how many patients, what the design is, all those things, I cannot comment on. Because quite honestly, at this point, um, that is not completely finalized. That will also need further discussion with the FDA, especially with the FDA. And uh, that is ongoing as we speak. I think it is extremely important, again, and this is, this is a task that we have, to take all the data that you've seen today and put it in front of the FDA. Make the FDA aware of what has been achieved. And it's, it's, in a sense, a psychological uh, process. They will not then jump and say, this is great, and you will have an approved product. But it will help them. They have seen, they have seen uh, bits and pieces. So it hasn't been pursued. No. We have, we have talked to the FDA. We've shown the FDA in regular uh, intervals what data has been produced. But I think. It struck me today, seeing everything that has been done so far, that it behooves us to put it together, not in bits and pieces, but as a complete picture for the FDA, if only for informational purposes. I, I think that, uh, that, that would be an excellent idea. And uh, um, I guess uh, on behalf of everyone in the audience, I'd say, what's your timeline to achieve that? Because if it can be done this year, um, then I think uh, you would see some movement, or well, people would see movement in that sort of time scale. Let me make two comments. So hopefully you guys have the idea. We've got really going forward the idea is, and we're going to finalize it here soon, two parallel programs. We're going to continue to work with the Novozyme drug to see what it does in kids, how well it works. But likewise, build on the experience from the Rotterdam trial, from the Duke trial, the Essen trial, with the Cho Cell product. Uh, take that forward into the clinic. We're now treating. Uh, eight more kids under the protocol that was developed at Duke. That, even if those results are spectacular, I, I guarantee you, eight patients is not going to be enough for the FDA to say, fine, go ahead. And even as you saw here, within those eight patients, the original three at Duke, the original uh, seven or so from the farming trial, there's still lots of questions about that data. Questions even about 
um, you know, antibodies, other things we've heard about. So what we have to do is work with all these docs to figure out what should the trial look like? What should this pivotal trial look like? And the plan is to continue forward in this phase one, two trial at Duke, to begin a phase one, two trial with the Novozyme drug, and to as quickly as we can either combine the programs or to continue on separate paths, figure out what's the best approach, design a phase three, a final pivotal study that's going to give us all the data we need. How many patients are going to be in that? My guess is maybe 30 to 50. That's consistent with the Fabray experience, but lots of docs are going to have to have to figure that out in our medical teams. Uh, when does that begin? The hope is that by the worldwide population. So we'll we'll take that risk. Well, That's correct. You could, it, that what they consider Maryland is a combined phase one, two. I'm sorry. So that's small scale. Yeah, that's, that, that's where we are right now, five to 10 or 15 patients. Bob Morrison's got the microphone. Um, but I'll be right in assuming that uh, another reason for choosing the Cho cell above the transgenic product is because that the milk has never achieved an FDA approval before. And secondly, that uh, Cho cell has. So uh, for that reason, they have a much greater chance of getting through the I FDA. I think one of the reasons, there are dozens of drugs that have been approved that are made in Cho cells. And to understand, when they say Cho cell, it's just a bio biotechnology manufacturing process using a certain type of cells to facilitate expression of the drug or protein you're trying to make. The dozens thing, of drugs have been approved with that. Uh, no drug has ever been approved transgenically produced. The other thing that I would add is that Genzyme does have a manufacturing uh, infrastructure that is geared towards Cho cell manufacturing. And therefore, the scale up for us in this particular technology will be a lot faster uh, than any other technology. We could even use potentially uh, re bioreactors that are in place at this point. So we, we feel very confident that we can do this rapidly. We feel very confident that we can scale it up so that the complete worldwide uh, patient population can be served. Those are really key parts of the decisions that we've taken so far. My answer would be my answer would be yes, but and the but is unfortunately the regulatory process. Whether we like it or not, uh, we're all fighting as much as we can to streamline it, to get the FDA to understand the disease and therefore deviate in a sense from, from what they are used to. Um, but it is it is a but that uh, we have to deal with. Yes. Yeah, one of the things we're trying to do is think about the disease not in these buckets or segments, infant, juvenile, adult, but and I think hopefully the doctors would agree, Pompeii is a spectrum of clinical presentations. And we're trying to think about designing a pivotal trial that will give us the data to support as broad an approval as possible. Yes. Is there in the process right now a work Depends how you define a ASAP. Part of the part of the pivotal study. Yeah, absolutely. The thinking. Let me make comment to the original thinking, and and that was clearly that by showing in infants that this product works, that the FDA would have a hard time to assume that it doesn't work in in the other uh, populations. Now that is a strategy that if you ask the FDA point blank, they would never support. So we take a risk with that. But we, uh, we thought at the time that that was the clearest path forward. Now, Novozyme has been thinking with their advisors about their clinical trial. And uh, since the merger only closed two days ago, we haven't even had a chance to completely uh, dig in what each other's thinking has been. And that needs to happen. And we need to pull the best people together, including outside resources, to bring us forward to define that particular trial that will get us approval. 
uh, will you see a, seek approval to treat all forms of pompe in the first go around? Or is it just going to be the children's? I, I think that's what Jan was getting to. Right now, between the clinical teams that have been working for years at Genzyme and the clinical team that I put together at Novozyme, there's some difference of thinking there. The, the Novozyme thinking was, well, maybe it makes sense in a pivotal phase three study to include adolescents and adults and to go for as broad an approval. Um, maybe that just slows things down because the patients are too heterogeneous. Uh, that, that may be a, a valid point. So, you know, to Jan's point, we're going to take the next couple of weeks or months and think about what's the best strategy for a phase three. Yeah, Andy. I'd just like to bring up that any drugs used in adults right now are, you read the label, you're not supposed to use it in kids. It would never approve because of children. But I give it to them all the time. It's called off-label use. And that's one thing you should think about is if you get it approved, if you get a license to give it to patients, there's nothing that a doctor couldn't do to give it to somebody else. That's true. So you get approved, let's say, for infantile heart, but there's nothing to say if there's enough enzyme that a doc couldn't go and get it and use it off label. No, this is what a doc can say, but it is not what a company representative can say. No, no, no. no that went. <laughs> we don't have brochures that say that, I promise you that. That is indeed, yeah. that is indeed well. a very important point, because at the end of the day, uh, and that element we haven't talked about at all today, that is a key, key element around the world, that the health organizations pay for it. Now, I must say, our experience in this, in this kind of area, in this kind of disease, is that there is a high level of commitment, and there's a high level of flexibility in the health organizations to pay. But here again, um, it, is, it is part of what needs to be thought through so that the best possible uh, package, if you want, clinical package can be presented so that reimbursement does not become a major obstacle. I, just to comment briefly, you, you're absolutely right, Andy. That, those are the facts, and that's the way life can and, and oftentimes does work. A doc can write a prescription for any licensed drug for any indication, any disease he wants. Um, the trouble is the FDA knows that. And that therein lies the rub that the FDA knows if, if we go maybe just for a limited approval for just infants that get it on the market and then everybody will write it for everything. The FDA knows that. And you know, and maybe the back of their minds, they're thinking, gee, do we know that it's safe in, in juveniles? Has it been tested thoroughly? And that's part of the discussion we have. We don't want to do, look, we just don't want to go in sequence because that's what the books say we have to do. We don't. You know, that's not the thinking. That's not how we work at Novozyme and certainly not at Genzyme. So we'll, we'll get real creative for how we deal with, with the agencies. I promise you that. Should that, shouldn't that be a question posed to the patients whether they're terribly concerned about you know, the level of risk they're willing to take? I understand the uh, difficulty of it and the complexity of it. The FDA has to propose certain standards. But I think to, to make it, to try to answer your question, it certainly is not a company issue. So I think this, this is between patient and physician. But you do bring up a good point, a much broader point, is that going forward over the next couple of months, years, what will be real important, and post-approval certainly for the public, the patient community to be as active and supportive and as vocal as possible to continue to get the best drug out. And that means, you know, not just calling us and talking to us, uh, but talking to legislators, regulators, everybody that you think is important in the process. A few questions. First question is, will your trial be involving more than just the American continent? Will your trial involve other continents than the U.S.? For the Novozyme specific trial at all? We haven't finished that design right now. There are a couple of sectors we're looking at. One, the University of Florida. The other, Washington Children's Hospital. Uh, and uh, the third is Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania. Uh, I don't know if all the centers would be in the United States, uh, but we know that it will be open to anyone from the world who qualifies with the inclusion or exclusion criteria. There may well be a European site or an Australian site as well. Just maybe to add, to, that. I mean, to add to that from a, a broader Genzyme perspective, we try to do 
most of our trials on a worldwide basis. Now, that, that, that depends a little bit on the product. It depends a little bit on uh, the complexity. But we have recognized that uh, it, it is important from several perspectives. It is important from the regulatory agency's perspective. I think it is important to solicit the support both from patients and physicians around the world. And lastly, uh, speaking about reimbursement, reimbursement agencies um, clearly want to see data in their own close environment, which means the United States as one larger entity and Europe as one larger entity. And then the Australians, they are totally different. They want to see, <laughs> they want to see the worst data in the world because they are the most difficult, but, but I don't want to. <laughs> it, 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 it's all about how realistic it is. I mean, to give an example, on the Hurler trial, I was called if there was a Belgian patient who wanted to be included one day before closure of the trial, he had to be by the next day in the south of Germany. That's not a realistic way of inclusion. Yeah, and unfortunately, those, those are the realities uh, of, of doing clinical trials throughout the world. Sometimes that happens, and sometimes you can't uh, be fast enough uh, to get patients to the right place. The second question is, um, when, if there is enzyme being, if the production capacity is there, Will there be an opening to compassionate use? The official point of view I've heard from Genzyme before is that's not allowed by regulatory authorities. In this case, it was my own government asking for compassionate use on behalf of a patient. So yeah, if I may uh, give that a try. I think compassionate use is the most difficult question um, for a company to address because obviously we want to do everything possible to give this drug as fast as we can to patients that need it uh, in, in emergency circumstances. The regulatory agencies don't like it. And um, I think my expectation is in this particular area, in this, in this disease, that regulatory agencies will be uh, lenient. So then it becomes a question of, is the product available? Can we get through the, the, all the rasmatas around it? Uh, and we will do it. We will do it as aggressively as we can. I would, again, urge um, patients in this case to be vocal and to work uh, through the system to put pressure on. It sounds awful that we have to say that, but I think it does work in the world. And, you should always, always be, uh, be aware of that. And the last question really is, um, I've, learned, I've come to um, be under the pressure, I've come to value the value of competition in this sort of issues. And I, under, I remember the old times when Arnold and I were trying to compete on getting our data out on, on, enzyme, on enzyme therapy five or six years ago. And it, wasn't f and it felt bad that we had to fight each other, but it also made me work a lot harder to bring things forward. And so all of a sudden now, since half a year ago, competition has disappeared in this market. And oh, I, I, I'll stop you there, because I disagree. Genzyme's not the competition. This disease, I got a lot of reason going home every night to want to get up the next morning to do this as fast as we can. I promise you, the only reason we merged with Genzyme, the only reason Genzyme wanted to buy Novozyme, is to move this faster, not slower. I promise you that. Could, could I just make a comment about, I think, um, Jan's re response about um, there needs to be pressure put on the system to make this move forward, particularly from uh, uh, patient and family support groups. And I think this really is a nice statement that illustrates the importance of having strong uh, family patient groups that are seen to be independent from the companies. Because I think if it comes from another direction, from, <coughs> from not the company, but also from you know, another vested interest group, if I can use that word, from the patients and families, then I think that adds weight to the, to the pressure. Yes, sir. This was certainly done with AIDS. I think we're all aware of how quickly drugs have been approved for studies have been approved. And it certainly seems to me that this is a little bit more life-threatening you know, it's like threatening in the long run, but you know, 
know, I, I think the issue of pressure is really underrated. I think we really need to free, you know, from the pressure. Quick, let me give you, because I was at Bristol Myers when a lot of the AIDS work was being done. AZT, from the time that they submitted their NDA, which is an application to put the drug on the market to get it to, to lots of people, from the time that that company submitted their uh, application to approval was 13 days. And there are going to be many key points in the next couple of years. And we're going to need your help to explain to everybody what we're doing, why we're doing it. I, I, agree. I, I would like to take you up on that because I think the most important thing that, for example, you could do after this meeting is summarize what you heard and may, make that hurt to Congress people, to wherever you can make it uh, clear. It is, it is a fact of life that this is very important. Good, good. I also want to say, though, that there's always a word of caution, not because you tape it, but for, for practical uh, uh, reasons. And again, I go back to uh, the experience we just had with uh, the Fabre uh, patient group. There has been a lot of pressure put on the FDA uh, to allow compassionate use. And as soon as the FDA had more than six requests the FDA said, why don't you do an official study with these patients? And we're back in the same uh, soup, if you want. So there is always, and I, I'm just saying that to make you aware, there is always somebody out there that wants data in a controlled fashion. And we have to uh, recognize that. But that does not diminish the point that I just made. But if, I mean, it would seem to me if it could be coordination of any response to the appropriate authorities, but not screaming at them, but giving them logical arguments about why things should move faster or uh, in a different way. I think that should be something that can be coordinated through the, uh, the family societies in the sense of providing contact points and names and so on. Um, I just wanted to make it clear for myself. Eventually, only one preparation of GA enzyme will be approved. Is that right? Or is it possible? So you're going to go ahead with a clinical, <coughs> excuse me, clinical trial with a Novozyme, right? And then there will be a parallel clinical trial with Cho enzyme, and apparently the patients who will already, who already got the rabbit and the transgenic enzyme will go ahead and receive the Cho. So, in a very, let's say, hopefully, in a very short time, there will be three sort of different clinical trials. Uh, but eventually, only one enzyme will be approved by FDA. Or is it possible that two products will be on the market? I think it is possible uh, that two products will be on the market at least for a while. I hope mm -hmm. that if there are more, if there is more than one product, that mm -hmm. the next best one is so much better that there will be good reason to have only that one on, on the uh, available. And I think if we, maybe I'm a little bit too idealistic, but then I think it is important to think about the next technology that can bring us forward instead of breaking, making incremental improvements to a product that does a very good job. Mm -hmm. And but I'm the, thinking about gene therapy or cell therapy exactly, or whatever right. else. Uh, but but is at the moment, is it right that there is a Cho enzyme made by Genzyme, and there is a product made by Novozyme, which is apparently free recombinant enzyme, right? That's or, part or of the process whatever, that you're making. Yes, yeah, yeah, whatever, yeah. yeah. And so, and two will be tried in clinical trials yeah. I, it, and will be compared under clinical, in patients, right? That, that is the plan. And only one will be eventually used. If, they, if there is a time difference between the one and the other, mm -hmm. we will push the one that can come to market quickest. And the other one will then be a second generation product. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think now that we are together, together right. We have a chance to look at things 
in the lab, if you want, or mm -hmm. in, in animal studies, and hopefully uh, can come to some answers uh, quickly in terms of the difference and how the difference applies, at least in an in vitro sense, and then right. hopefully very quickly in an in vivo sense. Yeah, please go ahead. There's, I mean, right now the thinking is let's get through the phase two studies, decide on the clinical data, which is the best product for patients, and take that into the pivotal phase three study. But to Jan's point, if there's a lag, and there may be a 6, 12, 18-month lag in the data, we're not going to wait, and we'll go forward with the drug that we have if it's showing safety and efficacy into the pivotal phase three. So there may be a first and second generation product that may only be a year or two apart. And that's a potential, too. So, you know, lots of this is happening in real time. So where are you with the clinical studies? What phase? They are in phase phase two, phase one, two studies to determine safety in a in how the initial. How far how far efficacy. into these phases are you? The um, the study uh, the the uh, Cho material uh, the the Duke material, if you will, has just fully enrolled its trial of eight patients. I believe five in the U.S., three in Europe, uh, just fully enrolled. So that's, that's where that trial is. The Novozyme trial has not yet begun, and uh, ANSA's trial has been ongoing for about two and a half years. Any idea when Novozymes is going to start? I think it'll probably be early next year. We, uh, the manufacturing should be complete in the November, December time frame, and then we've got to finish these last animal studies to make sure that the drug is safe in animals. Basically, just blow them up with enzyme for a couple of months to make sure they don't grow funny things out of their head and do other things. Uh, and then we'll apply the end of this year to the FDA to begin that study. And it's about 30 to 60 days from when you first file the papers to you inject a patient. Okay. Up the back. What's the uh, basic difference between CHO and Novozyme? They're both made in CHO. Again, CHO is just this biotechnology system for expressing proteins. They're both made in CHO. The only difference is at the end, the Novozyme scientists and manufacturing people sprinkle in a couple of other enzymes that manipulate and reconfigure the carbohydrate structure to add more of this mannose-6-phosphate. The theory being, if you do that, you may better target the enzyme to the cell. So, but we'll, we'll, you know, we'll continue to see if that's the case in the clinic. Randall? I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, so that everybody in the audience will understand the timeline, uh, I think you should go through, if you really start your clinical trial on other live products, Yeah, yeah. say start, I, day one doesn't mean you inject 10 to 20 patients. You have to enroll them over time or you'd overwhelm the centers. I, you know, I'd have to ask my doctors, Marilyn, about what the best way to enroll. My guess is...
Let me try to address one step uh, at the time. Take part 7B of that question first. Should have been a lawyer, Randall. That was good. I think uh, for the, um, both for the, for the patients and the physicians that are now using the transgenic material, it is extremely important to understand the CHO material and to get the data that we are uh, gathering, we will be gathering, I should say, over the next couple of months, so that it is very clear what you're looking at. And I think there needs to be a discussion between the treating physicians, definitely, and the company on how we are going to then transition. And I am sure that from a patient perspective, you will definitely be involved, although I leave that up to the, to the clinicians. So there are no, um, there is only one definite answer, I think, and that is that Genzyme will make the transgenic pro product available as long as that takes to get to that moment. We, we are starting to uh, address the issues on the CHO material that come out of the Genzyme bioreactors in the normal way we do drug development. Uh, so it's a very standardized process that uh, is known to clinicians and FDA. And that data will become available and will be discussed. There's probably a time for a brief two more questions or a few more questions, but, but I think then we should move on. Uh, have you considered to go for approval in any other jurisdiction in the United States? Yes, yeah, that's one of the things we need to think about. Where do you get approved fastest? You know. Well, since there's somebody from the orphan drug office uh, here, um, certainly over the last couple of months, Genzyme has um, thought about the delays, we call it delays, in the United States that are taking place on approvals. And clearly, um, we want to assemble data that is good enough for worldwide registration. But if it turns out that in one area we can get there faster than in another, we will go to where we get the fastest approval first. Dr. Nguyen, right up the back. I, th I think that is very early to, to give a specific answer to. What I would say, though, is that none of these products are going to be uh, cheap. And, and frankly, when I say cheap, I, I'm, the moment I say it, I don't even know what that means exactly. And I th I'm sure it means different things to uh, different geographies. So depending on where you live in the world, it means different things. Um, when you think about the average cost of treatment today for Gaucher patients and for Fabre patients, it is um, in the range between $75,000 and $300,000 a year, depending on uh, the weight in most cases and the regimen that physicians choose to treat patients. So these, these treatments are extremely expensive. One of the tasks that we have as a manufacturer and a supplier of these products is to make sure that the systems around the world pay for these products. And uh, there are no guarantees. We have been extremely successful on the Gaucher side. And about 99.9% .9 of patients get full reimbursement in the world. And for the 0.1%, we have put together a program where Genzyme uh, delivers uh, free goods to the patients until reimbursement is secured in these countries. Now, this does not apply to the United States because there is no issue in the United States. It does not apply to Europe because there is no issue in Europe. There is no issue in countries like Japan. There are issues, obviously, in countries where healthcare is um, or health care access is, is minimal. And so we have um, 
a limited number of Gaucher patients that benefit from this program. And as a company, we are very dedicated to these kind of programs. Okay. There was a bloke up the back with his hand up in the blue shirt. Sheila, yeah. 